this very old industrial paradigm centralized way of thinking is totally outmoded and it's just not going to work it's just not going to be fit for purpose to deal with this reality of this interconnected converging decentralized kind of systems that are emerging so i think one of the biggest tasks of our time is to explore how do we create new frameworks to be able to have these conversations how do we have new framework to be able to explore these things. I think that's where we really need to remove the boundaries because it's not going to be what we think it is. We're going to have to be able to think across silos, across boundaries, not just in terms of scientific disciplines, but even in terms of our managerial and you know departmental borders. All of that is going to have to shift because we're going to have to be able to have these conversations across those boundaries because those boundaries aren't going to exist in the same way in the next two decades. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Boundaryless Conversations podcast, where we meet with pioneers, thinkers, doers, and entrepreneurs and speak about the future of business models, organizations, markets, and society in the rapidly changing world we live in. I'm Stina Heikele. I'm co-host of the show alongside Simone Cicero. Hello, Simone. Ciao. Nice to be here. And today we are joined by Dr. Nafiz Ahmed. Nafiz is a systems theorist with over 20 years of experience and works as a change strategy consultant and investigative journalist. He is the creator of the Age of Transformation newsletter, where he writes about systems thinking for what he calls the global phase shifts. He's director of the Futures Lab at uh, United Communications Limited, where he leads on system transformation advisory services for governments, businesses and charities. He is also a a distinguished fellow at the Schumacher Institute for Sustainable Systems and a commissioner at the Club of Rome's Transformational Economics Commission. And not the least, he he is the best-selling author of eight books, including the first ever systems framework to understand interconnections of climate, energy, food, conflict, terrorism and state militarization. His latest book is Failing States, Collapsing Systems, Biophysical Triggers of Political Violence, published by Springer Nature. So... Lots of things there. Really great to have you with us, Nafiz. Welcome. Thank you both. Lovely to be here. We have a lot of, uh, of things to dig in, in but I'm going to start with a quite open question that kind of pulls together a little bit what we are doing at Boundaryless and your work. Our mission at Boundaryless is to enable everyone to participate in the future of organizing. And we do that by you know, providing frameworks for sense making and and uh, business modeling, uh, essentially. One thing that caught our attention was a film that you co-produced, Rethink Humanity, uh, which was based on a book by Tony Siba and James Arvib back in 2020, 2021, um, if I'm not wrong. And there you highlight how technological progress and forecasts, if you look at them through S-curves and how things evolve over time, are impacting a shift towards a new global civilization, essentially. And the underlying thesis there is that that new globalization, uh, global civilization would be more networked, more decentralized, and would enable people to participate in the new organization of society. So this seems to converge with our mission, and we would be interested to hear more about that thesis. I'd love to be able to talk about this issue. I I was very privileged to uh, work on that film, which essentially translates the ideas of our t- uh, two co-founders at Rethink X, uh, Tony Sieber and James Arbib, in their book on this issue, Rethinking Humanity. I was very fascinated to see how they broke this down. They essentially identify within the human system these five fundamental areas of production, which I think is a very useful way of thinking about technological change. So they say that really when you look at any society or any civilization, there is a production system which you can kind of identify in five key areas. So there's there's energy, transport, food, information, and materials. And I think this is this is a very useful way of looking at things because it helps you to understand not only what you know what are the key kind of uh, defining technologies using this definition, but then also you can develop an understanding of the crossovers between those sectors. But I think that the thesis was pretty profound, essentially identifying through empirical data, you know, what are the key kind of changes happening in these sectors? And I think what they found, we're at this very pivotal moment in in history, where we've seen 
in our own lifetimes that there have been you know big disruptions in the information sector you know for instance we're still experiencing that you know we saw it with smartphones now we're seeing it with ai we're seeing that there is a disruption in the energy sector as you know fossil fuels is being increasingly outcompeted by these new kind of renewable energy technologies and so on and so forth and what they essentially have argued is that every single one of these five fundamental foundational sectors of production that kind of define the capabilities of a civilization are all of them are being disrupted right now and this is quite a unique period in history because that's not happened before in human history in this way which i think that's that's the kind of the interesting point that they make in the past we maybe have had maybe a disruption in in you know the transport sector for instance cars the automobile and the auto assembly line disrupting uh, you know the horse and carriage industry which obviously was for millennia was it was was there um, and then suddenly you know in the you know kind of the late 18th kind of late 19th century early 20th century you had this kind of explosion of of innovation um, and very very rapid changes in, over a matter of decades which completely transformed the uh, transport system and then that in turn drove all sorts of other innovations across multiple sectors transport uh, disruption back at that time the invention of cars led to all sorts of changes in the way that we consume the way that we do mining the way we fight wars it you know kind of led to the complete reorganization of the urban landscape uh, everything changed you know even from a cultural point of view you know you had you know car culture changing the way that adolescents and young people actually you know engage and meet with each other and things like that and all so all the all of these kind of compounding innovations that occurred after that and which kind of le- led over to innovations in other sectors that perspective is quite useful because it helps you to realize that when we're looking at each of these sectors there is a fundamental technologies disruption taking place which means that the in the kind of the dominant industry or technology that's prevailing right now in those sectors is is in the process of being disrupted by new technologies which are outcompeting them really fundamentally for economic reasons and they're going on these learning curves where the technologies are exponentially improving the costs are going down so there are these economic drivers pushing this process forward and that's happening in every one of these foundational sectors at the same time that's obviously a stupendous kind of place to be. Also, it means it's almost it's, it's unpredictable in a way, in the sense that with that kind of innovation taking place, that okay, so there are certain kind of incumbent technologies that are going to be disrupted. You know, whether it's oil, gas, and coal, or livestock, kind of the livestock industry, you know, kind of conventional agriculture, for instance, in the food sector. We know that those are going to be disrupted. We know that there are new technologies which are which are going to become much more efficient and and as a result of those economic factors they're going to become much more dominant so one of the findings is that precision fermentation and cellular agriculture in the food sector is a stupendous cost declines um and you know it's just beginning to go up that s curve of adoption so we know that there are certain types of technologies which are going to be likely to kind of lead the way what we don't know is exactly how that process plays out what the follow on innovations and cascading effects of those technologies are and how that overall the, the overall impact of all of those different things happening at the same time how that changes our societal dynamics our cultural dynamics our governance dynamics in a way it means that everything's up for grabs because all of the kind of you know the the, the existing economic system and political system and even the our culture and ideology very much evolved around those kind of structures and systems of production which have you know which we're very familiar with which we define with industrial civilization so it means that we're going to have to kind of in a way innovate new organizational systems to manage and regulate the, this very new world that is coming into being so it's a very interesting place to be is there a, a way that we can imagine this transition to happen in a, at least a semi order semi controlled semi stable way and what could be the traits that characterize this uh, evolution for example this transition 
I guess it would be uh, somehow place-based uh, because of the biophysics uh, constraints that uh, we have to start uh, keep in mind and also your reference to foundational economies, you know, the basics really resonates with that. I'm talking about something that can be maybe more ab about small players instead of large players, a transition that deals more with um, adaptive postures uh, versus predictive postures. I'm also thinking about something that will kind of put uh, many of the boundaries that we have in question uh, between, you know, institutions or between sectors. If you have to kind of give a um, few traits of uh, this transition uh, or keywords, uh, what, what would they be? That's a really good question. I mean, I think um, that in order to answer that, it's very important that we have a kind of a solid, kind of almost, you know, scientifically and empirically grounded understanding of what these technology disruptions actually are and how they look like they're going to proceed. And there is a, quite a strong emerging uh, scientific literature on this, although the study of technology hasn't been recognized as a kind of scientific discipline in itself. But I think what we found increasingly different kind of uh, experts who are looking at technology disruptions are realizing that there are these very specific kind of features and dynamics at play, which kind of occur time and time again. So as I mentioned before, you know, if we, you know, we look at examples like the disruption of, of, of horses by cars, it's useful to look at these past examples because they give us a sense of what we're likely to see over the next two decades. So one of the things that we're going to see, for instance, is that disruptions are rightly called disruptions in the sense that they can often, when you don't, especially when we don't have an ability to see what's coming, because, uh, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, very difficult to understand. Disruptions are disruptive in the sense that they very much do shake up the existing status quo. And it can be quite surprising for the vast majority of people at the time. Now, if you look, if you look back at that, just at that example, when these nascent innovations were first emerging, you know, people were tinkering with these inventions of the car, and the people who were, were driving, going around in their horses and their carriages, were looking at them and saying, "You guys are just kind of like strange outsiders messing around with funny technology." And, and you know, you could, you would kind of feel justified in thinking that because these were these strange, you know, vehicles were you know breaking down in the middle of these kind of there weren't roads; they were just you know kind of these mud, you know, long avenues of mud. There was no infrastructure to allow cars, so you, it was completely beyond imagination at the time. Could these guys seriously do this? It seemed completely impossible. If you look at some of the, there's, you know, we had, there's some really iconic photos of, of New York City that my colleague Tony Sieber would he, he used these a lot, where you have a photo of New York City in 1900. You've got the, the slide is spot the horse. So sorry, spot the car. And there's only there's only one car, and there's a sea of these horses and carriages. And then the next photo is from 1913, and then the slide is called "Spot the Horse." There's just cars everywhere. The roads have changed, and there's like one horse only on. And it's quite a shocking depiction of how rapidly change can happen. So I think when we take some of those principles and we apply them to what we're seeing today. There are certain kind of dynamics that become clear. One of them is that there is a suite of technologies which I believe in, which a number, you know, my colleagues at Rethink X and several other people believe that are the disruptive technologies. And this is an empirical question. You know, there are some people who are looking at hydrogen, some people who are looking at carbon capture and storage, for instance, in the energy sector. But looking at the empirical realities here, it's very, it's pretty simple. It's solar, wind, and batteries that are going down these exponential cost curves, and as a result, they're being pushed along these exponential adoption rates. Um, and you just kind of use the kind of forecasting approaches to kind of see well, what's the probability distribution then of how fast these things are likely to scale based on previous types of cases. And what we can see is that these things can really happened very, very quickly within about 15 to 20 years. Now, of course, 
there are choices to be made which can delay or accelerate. But I think one of the things we're seeing is that the speed of that change is surprisingly fast. It may start slow at first, but it then kind of kicks off and it becomes rapidly exponential. So we're looking at very, very disruptive uh, kind of transformation in each of these sectors. Now, what that also means is it opens up a kind of uncertainty. Um, and I think this becomes clear when we're thinking about things like information. So, we, you know, we've seen, for instance, that in the information sphere, we've had you know, this multiple disruptions one after the other, you know, from the internet, you know, to smartphones to, you know, video streaming, you know, and on and on. And now we've got AI and AI is kind of kind of like an amplifying disruptor that is going to feed back into, across the information system. And of course, what we've also seen what's really interesting about the information disruptions is how they have completely and utterly transformed every other sector. You know, so we've had information disruptions changing transport, changing how we do food, changing materials. So, so one example is the impact of information on precision biology, where this, you know, applying computing power and machine learning and things like that, uh, to, and you know, is allowing us to now develop these new ways of dealing with molecules, um, which has kind of driven this innovation called precision fermentation, where we're now able to essentially program molecules, program proteins, and essentially create any protein that we want. And now the costs of that are going down. So the other thing that we're seeing is the interconnectedness across domains, which I think has always to some extent happened, but that inter interconnectedness is becoming even more kind of um, impossible to kind of override. And that's what's also making things unpredictable in the sense that what we, what we can say with a degree of certainty is that certain technologies are likely to scale very fast, very rapidly, exponentially. They will very likely disrupt existing status quo technologies. Those technologies are likely to, in terms of the, you know, they, they will ultimately be replaced. So, so that also creates obviously questions around mm -hmm. jobs. The biggest question, of course, is, you know, economic losses for those incumbents and a question of how to manage that process in a way which, as you, you, you mentioned this question of, is there a stable path through this and i think that, that there's there's various scenarios here which all depend on on human choices and that's why i, I really want to emphasize that technology you know, understanding these technology dynamics doesn't really allow us to be deterministic or necessarily super optimistic or, or super pessimistic it, it gives us a certain sense of we okay so we we have a certain sense of certain dynamics that are very likely to take place but it really it's going to be up to us to choose how we manage that because it, let, let's just say for example in the energy sector and in the transport sector where we know that there are these just big disruptions taking place which are disrupting oil and gas and oil and gas demand so what happens with the incumbent industries if they do nothing and kind of double down on their existing kind of business models and kind of just keep asking for more subsidies and trying to keep going, that's not going to work because the economic dynamics inevitably going to mean that these guys get outcompeted. So what's the way forward? So there has to be a kind of a, a, a kind of strategic approach which says, well, these are the possibilities ahead. Is there a way for us to pivot in such a way that we can minimize the damage and the losses and maximize the gains? So there's a strong case, for instance, to say, well, if we turn a blind eye to this and ignore it, we could see a situation where there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of workers in the oil industry who are left without work. They, 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 there could be all sorts of cascading effects on politics and culture, um, which could destabilize our societies. On the other hand, there is a huge dividend that could be right there around the corner if we look at it from a, another perspective which says well actually we have this huge opportunity where we know that certain industries are now going to be disappearing but we have this window of opportunity over the next decade to ensure that we retrain utilize the existing infrastructure of these industries and the expertise that's been built up and redirect them into the industries of the future which are emerging now 
in the right way and do this along a science-based timeline where we can kind of reinvest huge profits that the incumbent industries are making into these new kind of innovations that are taking place. And there are interesting examples of, you know, European companies where, you know, you've had, uh, I can't remember the name, but there was a very famous European uh, company, which incumbent uh, oil and gas company, which realized what was going on and pivoted and is now a clean energy company. Um, So there's lots of examples where this can happen. But I think what we learn from history is that that's rare. A lot of the time, the incumbent industries just get wiped out because they don't understand what's coming. They don't understand the dynamics of the new industries and new technologies. And they're very, you become complacent, you know, like the horse and carriage industry being there for hundreds, thousands of you know, years. You kind of tend to think, well, nothing's going to change. It's just going to stay the same. But I think what we're now learning due to complex systems theory and, and, and a lot of these different uh, models and, and abilities to kind of use data, we're now starting to see that actually change isn't linear. It's, it's, it happens very, very fast, very rapidly, and in a cascading way. So I'm trying to kind of weave some threads here, right, for our listeners. And I think you said many very interesting things. You said, first of all, let's look at the data. So let's look at the empirical evidence of the transformations that are happening. And you, you mentioned clean energy transitions. Maybe there are some other, uh, um, you know, kind of threads that, that are manifesting themselves in data uh, that we should be looking into. Then another thing that, that, I, that I know that is essentially prepare for the unthinkable and prepare for the unthinkable to happen fast uh, in, in an exponential way, right? You spoke about the transition from the horse to the, to the car. It was completely unthinkable. There was no um, infrastructure. So essentially, as any player you are uh, that, that's listening to this, prepare to, um, you know, see this transition happen fast and uh, uh, be, um, I would say, ready uh, to work uh, in a context where there is no infrastructure, there is no clarity, it's really difficult to understand. Another thing that is very important that I think it's coming up again for us, you know, we had a conversation with uh, with another speaker, Mark von Reinemann, uh, if I if I say it well, uh, a few weeks ago about how do you interpret the future, and uh, this idea of convergences was really strong. So the idea that to really understand the impacts, maybe you have to play with convergences. So you have to take one technology, another one, or maybe one thread, another thread, and see how they converge together. And what does it mean? So, for example, you spoke about uh, information technology and data and genomics. Uh, and we can probably do similar considerations around AI and this new emergence of AI capabilities with, with uh, existing context. That's another uh, thing. So, again, look at the data, prepare for the unthinkable and explore convergences. But then you said, there are both uh, challenges and opportunities. And you spoke about the we a few times. You know? So you said, we should be strategic, right? That's what I perceive. We should look at the situation and we can see where, where can we reap the benefit? Where should we be ready to let, let, let go? Maybe some, some of the existing things we have. So who is the we? So where do you see and what kind of behaviors you see po- possibly in the future of the policymakers, the large incumbents, and the small players. So if you have to say, if you are a policymaker, do this. If you are a large incumbent, do this. If you are a small player, do this. Or prepare in a certain way. You know, adopt a certain posture. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, hearing from you about this. And maybe also, who is the biggest candidate for instability here? So where, where should we think about uh, instabilities? In terms of the instabilities, I think there's now it's now becoming quite clear that there are incumbent industries across each of these five foundational production sectors which are going to be disrupted. And that's where we're going to see the biggest kind of instabilities and that will have social, political and economic ramifications. Now, I'm seeing, I mean, obviously the energy system is perhaps the most pivotal production sector because it's at the bedrock of everything that we do, you know, it's at the center of everything, you know, you can't move without energy, you know, fundamental physics. Um, So I see that as being a kind of a focal point for the big changes that are coming. 
And I think what we're seeing, certainly what I'm seeing and what I've argued is that the energy sector today is experiencing both internal and external disruption pressures. So the internal pressures are coming from problems within the existing industry. One of the ways of tracking this, there is a measure called energy return on investment, uh, EROI, which essentially measures the amount of energy that you use to get a certain amount of energy out. Um, so it's a kind of a simple ratio, but it can be very, very complicated to figure it out because obviously, how do you measure the energy that you're using and how do you measure the energy that you're getting out? At what point do you measure it? Uh, there's obviously many, many different uh, kind of components of uh, an energy production process in, in oil and gas you know there's obviously there's the exploration there's the mining there's the extraction there's the refining and all, all you know there's all sorts of things there's the transporting the the stuff that you that you can use and then there's the point of delivery when it actually becomes usable energy and there's all sorts of debates in the literature about that but I think there is a consensus that's emerged, which has shown that absolutely you know, we had the the heyday of the fossil fuel industry is is well over. You know, I mean, we had um, maybe the ratio was looking at triple digits. You know, in the, in the early days of the oil industry around a century ago, um, you know, a hundred to one. That ratio has you know plummeted to the point that most good analyses of EROI are looking at the value being around six to one you know for oil and gas today we you know we've moved from the most cheapest stuff to the more expensive stuff and that has an impact it means that the costs of your production are going up it means that the costs the amount of energy that you're using to get the energy out is going up and that has an impact on your society because if you the, you know the, the less energy that you then have left over um, means that there's less energy for all the other things that you would want to do outside the energy system in your society, whether it's all sorts of economic activities, um, public goods and services, so on and so forth. So what we're seeing is over the last 20 years, that process has really accelerated. And I think that's been reflected in as an underlying driver of many of the economic challenges that we've had and why we are experiencing this kind of strange period of very, very slow uh, economic growth globally. If not, you know, it's kind of flatlined. It doesn't really seem to be going anywhere. Of course, this has been exacerbated by other complex emergencies, such as the, uh, you know, the, you know, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, suddenly out of the blue um, kind of, also kind of impacted the economy in a very drastic way. Um, and it also highlights exactly what, you know, this term of these convergences, which are not just happening in technology, but also happening between different elements of, of the human system and the earth system. You know, so you've got the energy system on the one hand, we've got our relationship with the earth system and our natural s systems, um, which for whatever, you know, has led to a global pandemic. So these things end up compounding each other. And of course, then they have an impact on the economy and that's without even mentioning obviously the biggest kind of ecological crisis that we're that we're seeing which is climate change which is obviously kind of brewing away on the horizon apparently quietly in the background but it's impacting us every day so i think when you take all of that and you try to kind of have an understanding of the of the issue of who you know, where does the instability really lie i think first of all the oil and gas industries are going to face a reckoning because as they're facing these internal challenges domestically, and some scientists are saying that by around the early 2030s, those internal dynamics are going to make, one assessment says that by around 2050, you'll be using 50% of the energy from oil just to get the oil out. You know, and earlier than that, it will be like a quarter, but around 2030, it'll be like a quarter of the energy or something like that. I mean, that's just crazy. It's a crazy amount of energy just to get keep the energy system going. It's not sustainable. It's not going to work. So this is without looking at climate change. That's without mm -hmm. looking at the demand dynamics that will come into play as renewable energy technologies increasingly scale up, which they're already beginning to take a chunk now out of the energy demand. And, you know, coal has kind of faced a massive disruption already, which has actually had a tangible impact 
on carbon emissions. It slowed the growth of emissions. So as it begins to feed into oil and gas, that's going to accelerate too. Obviously, the electric vehicle disruption is also taking place. That is also, you know, if you look at the various forecasts, you know, again, within the next decade or so, that is going to take a huge chunk uh, out of the oil demand for oil and gas. What that means is that these industries are going to face a reckoning um, within the next decade. So, you know, both their internal economic challenges and their external kind of lack of demand. You know, imagine a, 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 an industry which is already suffering from problems. I mean, these industries are sustained by trillion dollar subsidies, you know, every year. That's what keeps them alive. So the moment when they start to lose significant amounts of profit because demand starts to evaporate, they're just not going to be able to survive. They, you know, that's, and that's going to be extremely disruptive. What's interesting is that that's not the only disruption taking place. I mean, I think one, I think in term, uh, at Rethink X, the areas that we were really interested in were uh, transport and food. So we were looking at electric vehicles as well. And the food sector is also one that I think has taken people by surprise because um, what we found is that precision fermentation in cellular agriculture is going through those very same S curves that we've seen, you know, with smartphones, you know, with um, you know, as we're seeing in the energy sector, they're going through the same thing, and those costs mm-hmm. have, are going down. And already we're seeing these huge innovations in precision fermentation. It essentially means that at the moment most of the disruption is taking place right now in terms of traditional kind of vegan foods. We're getting better at producing. Uh, non-animal uh, proteins but that's n- eventually within the next few years is going to you know animal proteins are going to be become much more commercially viable as well and eventually it's going to get uh you just looking at those cost trajectories it's likely to get 10 times cheaper um around you know the kind of 10 to 15 years from now something like that um give or take depending on policy choices around you know regulation and things like that those are the things that can mm-hmm. obviously affect these issues like you can accelerate or delay you can't really change those fundamentals though so what that means is that i think that there are these th- key sectors which are definitely going to f- experience these big transformations so that's the livestock industry um the you know kind of the conventional energy uh, industries the fossil fuel industries Obviously, those are very interconnected because the conventional livestock industry um, does depend on the existing energy system. But that's also, that's also going to affect uh, kind of normal conventional agriculture as well, because conventional agriculture is, again, very dependent on these kinds of fossil fuel energy inputs at the moment. And of course, I think that you know, we have to talk about AI because we can see the information system is going through this huge disruption. That's also affecting uh our kind of innovations in materials, you know, things like nanotechnology and precision biology, as I mentioned, obviously affecting food. Um, but in itself, we can see that AI is going to kind of have this really interesting effect on many of the kind of working tasks that we kind of take for granted, which are currently supplying people with uh, with jobs. Those are some of some of those are there's, there's going to be a, a huge swathe of disruption, which makes it much cheaper and easier to have to automate many of these things so that opens off this this very very kind of startling question as to well which sector isn't going to be facing instability in in that sense and it does in my view there isn't a, se- a any sector which which is not going to be affected by these areas which that may seem on its face slightly overwhelming but i think using the the five foundational kind of categories to think it through allows us to come up with a slightly more strategic approach because then we can begin to see, well, wait a minute, if it's these particular technologies in these sectors which are likely to be disrupted, what as investors can we do to pivot? What as governments can we do to pivot? What as companies within those sectors, you know, maybe we are an incumbent company, what can we do to pivot from that? So I think what we need here is that kind of approach where everyone kind of steps back and says well wait a minute let's do an assessment let's look at this data let's understand where we are let's understand what the risks are what the opportunities are and then that obviously has specific implications for different kind of players and actors in this context so you know if you're an incumbent kind of company um, who is likely to face disruption 
then you might want to learn from the history of a company like IBM, which, you know, was going to be disrupted by these kind of things. But actually what they did, you know, they they took a certain, they, they created a company which was going to focus on new innovations that were disrupting them. And that company eventually grew. And then they that company essentially took over and became the new IBM. Um, and kind of all the other old stuff was kind of left to go to the side. And we've kind of seen, there's a, there's a few cases in history where we've seen that there are strategies that companies within sectors that are being disrupted can actually do to ensure that they can pivot uh, and kind of mitigate losses and, and kind of be really kind of kind of maximize their existing expertise in a way that and their resources to allow them to move into a really kind of uh, kind of much better situation. But of course, not all companies are going to do that. And there's a question of what how do governments look at this? And I think governments very much need to step up to understand that they have to play a very active role in rethinking some of the things that they're doing. You know, I mean there's huge amounts of taxpayer money which are being spent on propping up industries that are already facing significant economic problems and challenges. And rather than just throwing money at these things, what we need to do is think about how we do that strategically. There are ways in which they can they can uh, kind of reevaluate those approaches. Um, but that obviously means that they need to rethink, for instance, what are the areas that we should be investing in you know if, if if government money is going to go somewhere where should it go you know what are the industries that it should go and how what's the best way to support that that for instance might mean recalibrating markets you know i don't think i think because a lot of these technologies are scaling exponentially i don't think many of them need subsidies i mean there's an interesting debate here to be had but i think it's more about eliminating subsidies for the old stuff kind of supporting workers in those industries to move into new sectors and then thirdly ensuring that the mar- that kind of helps you to level the market playing field by saying well let's actually allow these companies and these enterprises to compete on a fair playing field rather than saying well let's just keep throwing loads of money at these guys um and hopefully and then allow these guys to compete on their you know in a you know in a very unequal playing field it's, it's less about doing that so for instance i would say do we need a carbon tax I'm not quite sure, but does a carbon tax make sense when you're spending trillions of dollars of money and propping up carbon companies? Maybe it makes sense just to get rid of those subsidies and, and that's your way of dealing with that issue. So, but those are things that we need to be exploring and obviously at different levels, depending on where you are, you're going to see this in a different way. I think this uh, really uh, ties neatly into another topic that, uh, of course, is very close to our hearts, which is around uh, business ecosystems and platforms. Because when you are talking about disruptions and the incumbents being disrupted, that's essentially what uh, the platform revolution or the the ecosystem thinking is sort of all about, to challenge the assumption of one uh, big player dominating the market and, and kind of capturing the opportunities that is within an ecosystem. When I'm listening to you, I'm wondering what role will the ecosystem and innovation through the ecosystem have in this? Because you were talking about the different demand dynamics that we can see around electric vehicles, food systems, energy, and and to some extent, this can also be helped by AI. There can be different forms of, of innovation happening. But I think like would be very interested to explore the decentralized innovation in these fields and and if we move beyond the idea of even having those large industrial incumbents because this seems to be part of the old paradigm and the old system that we've had structuring uh, our civilization so what kind of new organizational coalitions alliances ecosystems will emerge and you were talking about uh, you know the role of governments and you can see now in the EU uh, for example this uh, big bet on on having five missions on the EU level and a lot of research and innovation going into those this is a way to t- kind of make governments and organizations work together uh, maybe sometimes you know you never know if this is too much top down because the ecosystem tends to be more disobedient and actually be a disruptor itself so I think it would be will be interesting to see how 
how that will play out because that adds another level of uncertainty. Who is going to innovate what and, and where when the opportunity comes? And should, if the incumbents want to be on board, maybe the best strategy will be to have a radical open innovation ecosystem and be part of it uh, rather than trying to sort of protect itself against it. Well, this is a really fantastic point. And I think it, it gets to the heart of one of the um, issues that often we forget when we're looking at, when we're talking about technology, is that technology, in order for us to kind of make the most of, to, of, of these technological changes, and, and you know, there, ha- there is an organizational shift that has to take place. And I think this is one of the really uh, powerful insights that I saw in the work of um, Tony Sieber and James Arbib when they were looking at past civilizations and this kind of the life cycle of civilizations. One of the really interesting insights they had is that the civilizations might end up, you know, innovating various technologies and kind of having these new kind of innovations coming into being, but they have to be able to manage and regulate those. Uh, technologies and that often requires a fundamental shift in the organizing system of the civilization or society so they they basically created these two categories you know the production system and an organizing system and you know they described the organizing system as being consisting of you know lots of these different areas that we're familiar with you know, it can be governance institutions it could be politics it could be culture values world views ethics many many different things kind of contained you know certain you know business models all sorts of things you can can, contain in in, you know what an organizing system is and i think the challenge that we're now seeing you know they argued that if a civilization uh, is not able to evolve an organizing system that can actually manage the kind of you know new kind of developments that in its production sectors it's not going to survive it will end up uh, kind of regressing and, and if at worst it could end up collapsing um, and that's obviously not the only reason a society could collapse it could collapse due to many other things you know external pressures but that was one of the the patterns that they they, they saw in history I think that has a lot of uh, really very um, profound implications for where we are going today it means essentially that in order for us to kind of manage and regulate um, you know these kind of big technological innovations, we really need to understand the organizational implications. And you both mentioned uh, and have mentioned previously that, you know, we're looking at this movement towards more networked, decentralized kind of kind of a space that's emerging. And that's really important because I think absolutely certainly the trend line that we're seeing is that the kind of prevailing industrial system you know when you then look at these different sectors of production is very much built on these quite centralized hierarchical structures which involves you know with oil gas and coal for instance is very much premised on centralized fragmented control of these specific resources which are hierarchically controlled you know it's the same thing when it comes to agriculture same thing even if we're looking at the old information system it used to be like that you know a tiny number of people owning and controlling um kind of the information waves and, and that's now starting to be disrupted um, with the kind of the platform revolution and you know the, before you know would you know in order for you to reach millions of people you would have to put out you know an advert in a print newspaper which would cost you you know perhaps tens of not hundreds of thousands of pounds now you can do it at the click of a button uh, on social media and you can reach millions of people but obviously there are still what's i think what's interesting about this is that we're seeing with the information disruption we're seeing that there's been this definite technological shift right and obviously the cost dynamics make it quite clear okay so now it's much cheaper to reach millions of people anybody can now produce videos they can produce written you know written stuff and content and they can get it out there and they can reach lots of people what's interesting about that though as we've seen with the polarization of politics and culture um the kind of the degradation of of public discourse around these issues but you know around the issues that we're facing what we're seeing is that even though we've had a technological kind of shift but the culture 
and the uh you know the kind of the organizational kind of framework hasn't really changed it's still and it's still kind of framed within a very unequal economic organizing system so you know that's why you've had big platforms like you know facebook google all the rest of it still owned and controlled by a tiny number of people you know there's still all these kind of same conventional lobbying kind of interests involved all that kind of stuff and that's created this very strange scenario right where you have this apparent decentralization of information but yet it's happening within these very centralized organizing structures mm-hmm. and yet even amidst all of that there is still this kind of decentralization process taking place now with ai for instance we're now seeing um, this new space emerging where it looks like if we're following some of these cost trajectories you know there are going to be all sorts of functions that are going to end up being something like 10 times cheaper and will eliminate the need for human labor in many many sectors now on the one hand looking at it from a conventional organizing system point of view that seems really scary because you immediately think well what's going to happen to all those jobs and so you've had people talking about well we need to have the government response which kind of leads like a UBI universal basic income where we can make sure that people still have the means to live and so on and so forth so that's in my view i think that's looking at it from the same existing organizational economic framework what i thought was very exciting about the ai potential is what it means from an economic point of view because the fundamental limiting factor in an economy is labor you know it's la- it's productivity of labor is your is the biggest thing that is that basically means that your economy is not going to be able to kind of move forward if you can eliminate that as a limit then you, then literally the sky is the limit when it comes to economic productivity and growth so we're seeing with this opportunity with ai this possibility of limiting of, of sorry of of removing the one thing that is limiting the economy um and that means of course that your economy itself is going to be fundamentally transformed and it's obviously not just ai that's, that that we're seeing this transformation when we're seeing the fundamental underpinnings of energy being changed so that we're moving from a possibility of a world based on kind of competition over scarce resources into a different world where we're looking at actually sharing abundant clean electricity that's a very different type of economy to what we're looking at now so that raises the question of what kind of organizing systems do we have in place where the need for human labor is actually reduced does that mean that we just kind of plaster over a bandaid and say we need ubi well maybe as a transitional mechanism we do but i think if we kind of break out our imaginations and think well what does a world look like where people uh, don't need to do you know menial labor is is even further eliminated and i think rather than looking at it as, as a, you know there are of course apocalyptic scenarios which i wouldn't want to rule out for no reason but i think we also need to look at the fact that there may well be almost semi utopian scenarios um and it's not exactly far fetched given that the human labor over time has reduced like we, the the amount of uh human labor that we're doing today compared to what we were doing say several millennia ago is completely different it's completely changed so these things that we might think were are unthinkable now today was unthinkable to people a thousand years ago so that what seems unthinkable is actually worth exploring and worth thinking about because it opens up these possibilities the question then of course is how do we navigate this you know in, in terms of a practical way forward and i think this i what what we certainly need what we're certainly seeing is that the trend line of these technologies as they are more networked and more decentralized and more participatory there is this opportunity space that's opening up and what we can see is that the way in which these technologies work best is in a networked distributed way they don't work best when they're part of a centralized old organizing system and i think that is the key that we need to think about the question that we then need to do is we need to kind of uh, in my view this really is interesting because it means that even our conventional ways of thinking about these things are going to be challenged you know they're, they're going to be outmoded so the way in which we we do things at the moment, we're very very siloed we're very very fragmented you know we've got 
economists thinking in one department about one thing. You know, you got the energy guys thinking about something else. And this is very old industrial paradigm, centralized way of thinking. And it's totally outmoded and it's just not going to work. It's just not going to be fit for purpose to deal with this reality of this interconnected, converging, decentralized kind of systems that are emerging. So I think one of the biggest tasks of our time is to explore how do we create new frameworks to be able to have these conversations? How do we have new frameworks to be able to explore these things? And that is a kind of a foundation for us to be able to say, how do we now innovate new organizational approaches approaches to managing this new world that's emerging? And I think that's where we really need to remove the boundaries because it's not going to be what we think it is. We're going to have to be able to think across Mm -hmm. silos, across boundaries, not just in terms of scientific disciplines, but even in terms of our managerial and you know departmental borders and things all of that is going to have to shift because we're going to have to be able to have these conversations across those boundaries because those boundaries aren't going to exist in the same way in the next two decades certainly we perceive the massive responsibility that uh, each of us have in exploring these futures right so one thing that um, comes to mind it's really you know this first person uh, responsibility that we have as organizational builders, our citizens, and so on. So it's not something we can wait for someone to come with a recipe, right? It's more like uh, we have to participate in it. Another thing that um, I have in mind is this question uh, uh, around, you know, what's going to stay industrial to some extent? So w- what is the role of centralization in this kind of decentralizing world where energy is decentralizing and, and you know, capabilities uh, for, uh, you know, you, you spoke about precision fermentation, we can expand it to AI and, and um, genetics and you know, whatever. So if these capabilities are de- uh, decentralizing together with uh, a massive decentralization in energy, what will remain centralized? What's uh, going to decentralize? How is this interplay going to work? And, in, you know, and again, another question that I have in mind is what's going to happen to the non-foundational elements of the economy? So what's going to be about, you know, our consumer economy that has been built on top of the industrial uh, structures that have governed our civilization for the last probably 200 years or something like that? So really lots of questions from, from, this, from this conversation with you today. So I don't know if you maybe want to add some final remarks that can help, uh, I don't want to say make uh, clarity on what's going to happen, but maybe uh, if you if I ask you to just, you know, highlight a few points for the listeners, what would they be? Well, I think the first most important thing is for us to recognize that um, there is a real amazing opportunity uh, that we're seeing with these technologies. And even, you know, I think you know, there's a lot of people who are worried about AI, they're worried about climate change, worried about all these things. It's absolutely right to, for, for, to, to be concerned about the future because if we make the wrong choices, things could, of course, go really bad. But I think what's really exciting is the new opportunity space that is opening up, which in many ways is unprecedented. You know, with the energy system, for instance, again, You know, when we're using the lens of disruption to understand this, we can see that we're not looking at these are not one for one substitutions. And I think conventional analysts often look at these issues like that. Oh, there's a new product that's going to replace the old product. And that's it. And the system stays the same. Actually, what we see with disruptions is that it changes the whole system. The system changes. What does that mean? When a system changes, it means that the rules and the properties of the way you organize yourself, those change. You know, so. That's why when horses were disrupted, total transformation, you know, roads changed, everything else changed, the rules and the properties of the system completely changed. And that created new possibilities as well. Some of them negative, some of them positive. Um, What we're seeing here with energy, for instance, is there is this possibility space of super abundant clean electricity. When we're looking at the cost curves of these technologies, we're seeing that the price of energy is, as it continues to get cheaper, it's going to be around 10 times cheaper than the incumbent system within the next 10 to 15 years. You know, it's already 
you know, it's, all, it's already cheaper than incumbent electricity, incumbent, incumbent energy systems. And that's only going to get much better. And I think one of the other interesting things that we found at Rethink X, there's many other uh, research groups who have confirmed the same thing, that when you optimize the way that you design that system, um, and that means kind of the generating capacity of solar and wind has to be kind of supersized by around three to five times demand, just depending on the region and so on and so forth. That means that your battery inputs are massively, massively reduced by about 90%. And that also means that the mineral inputs and the metals and materials inputs are actually much, much lower because the battery system is the most expensive component of the system. So this is obviously, I'm getting down in the weeds a little bit, but the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to make clear that when you get into the empirical nitty gritties of some of these technologies, you really begin to see exciting possibilities because that means in this particular case that you will be producing three to five times more energy than we're currently producing today in, in the current existing fossil fuel system with far, far less metals and minerals inputs. And so counterintuitively, you can have more energy, but we are actually using kind of less damage to the planet. Of course, there are lots of questions we need to answer along the way. If we're going to be ramping up lithium production and so on and so forth, how do we do so in a way which protects, you know, we create a circular economy? We adopt an approach which doesn't damage the environment, which doesn't create these kind of over-extractivist models and so on and so forth. But we're moving into a system which is very different because, you know, once you've built out that energy system, it lasts something like, you know, most solar panels and wind turbines actually last up to around 50 years. So once you've, once you've built it, you don't need to keep rebuilding. You actually now have a solid kind of uh, infrastructure which can then be the basis for, for you know future manufacturing and so on and so forth. So when you're looking into these possibility spaces and you combine that with what's happening with you know our ability to make clean you know proteins, our ability to kind of uh, deal with information cheaply and kind of um, kind of reduce the need for kind of uh, kind of manual labor and so on and so forth. What we're actually seeing is this unprecedented possibility space for a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a new civilization, a new system that really upgrades our capabilities and allows us to do far more than we ever thought possible, and which in turn opens up a new space for us to think about how we want to organize our societies in a way which everyone can benefit. And I think this is really exciting because we've never seen that possibility before in that way. You know, people have talked about utopian societies throughout history but i think what we're seeing is that there is we're, we're really walking a knife edge with this thing that we call the global phase shift where there's a fundamental reordering taking place which means that if we make the wrong choices we could end up aborting a lot of these things you know if we don't accelerate the clean energy transformation fast enough even though the you know many of these dynamics are unstoppable the problem is is that if we don't do it fast enough we're, all, we're going to hit that climate danger zone of 1.5 C, if not 2 degrees Celsius. It's happening fast, it's happening exponentially, but it's not happening fast enough to get us out of that danger zone, which of course could trigger all sorts of runaway feedback effects and so on and so forth that could allow the climate system to go out of control. And that, you know, that's just looking at this one sector, you know, the, the interplay between energy and the environment. But what that says to me is that this, is, this really is the most pivotal decade in human history, you know, the decisions we make right now are literally going to determine the fate of the entire human species. So yes, it's a, it's a lot to take on, but it means that each one of us has this really pivotal role to play. You know, the choices that you and I make today are literally going to be the things that are going to determine what happens to us for the next few millennia. So I think with that in mind um, and kind of and really focusing on the positive possibility space, you know, I think we can if we work together, we, we you know, we can you know, what we're seeing is that there are there's a tremendous opportunity that's opening up for us. But we very much need to understand what is happening, use the best of our science and our data uh, to inform our decision making process and really learn new ways of collaborating with each other so that we can have these conversations because we need to make these decisions now. 
Thank you so much for also bringing it back to sort of a little bit of that beginning of this new civilization that for the first time maybe we have actually a possibility because it's it's uh, visible uh, to us much more than it has been in the past. And we can use this more networked and distributed way of accessing information, accessing means of, of production, let's say, and value creation in an entirely new way. And the, the big question that we are facing now is, is the organizing system going to keep up? And that is very clear for me from, from everything that you have shared, like that will require a reckoning in some of the key uh, production systems that we are looking at. And, and, th- and this is really like the, the something that we are very, of, of course, passionate about contributing our small bit to in boundaryless by doing sort of frameworks and so on. And then your knowledge that you are sharing, you know, on the internet, uh, it's, it's great for creating that awareness for people of what is actually happening. So thank you so much for, for the conversation today. Before we, we leave, uh, we want to ask uh, you to leave some breadcrumbs with our listeners. So anything that is, they should keep in mind. Well, at the moment, I've been reading this book by um, a cognitive neuroscientist by the name of Bobby Azarian. It's called uh, The Romance of Reality. It's a fascinating book which brings together some of the cutting edge developments in physics and biology um, and systems theory and really showing how there is a new paradigm that's emerging about the nature of the physical reality. Um, And it's really exciting. It's showing us kind of the interconnected complexity of the real world. And also, I think what's really interesting is that he's kind of situated many of the things happening today in our lives in in this kind of wider kind of cosmic physics-based understanding of an evolving universe, which is moving actually towards a direction of kind of uh, increasing complexity um, and so on and so forth. So it's really it's really interesting because he really kind of, I think the implications for us today are that for in terms of how we're looking at our organizing systems and our societies, that there is a kind of there is a forward direction that evolution is moving us towards, which is actually part you know it's part of nature, it's part of the physical universe, um, and our, our job really is to kind of try and really use our sense making skills to align ourselves with that trajectory. What was really exciting about what Azari, you know, he could he calls it kind of a cosmic. A trajectory but you know there's no superstition there's no kind of like supernatural stuff in there it's um it's all based on a, a hard kind of hard science hard data so i found that really exciting thank you so much that, that was a um, really great and deep conversation i think what i bring home is uh, that uh, um, we should uh, ask contributors or in general workers and, and, and entrepreneurs we shouldn't think about um, stable perspectives. You know, we should really think think of the world as in flux, and and maybe we should be aggressive enough with taking risks uh, based on uh, projections. Uh, you know, based on rooted in data and rooted in uh, the reality of what's happening. You know, making projections of the world that uh, of a of a different world that can ha- happen fast enough. You know, so it's essentially. Transitions, as you said, happen fast. Uh, they are happening faster and faster. So it's really uh, the moment for us to be ambitious, right? In terms of uh, uh, how we can contribute to this to this transformation from a business perspective, from an organizational perspective, and, and maybe from a, from citizens as well perspective. So um, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed the conversation. Very much. So thank you. Thank you, Sina, for your always great questions. Thank you. And for our listeners, of course, uh, you can find uh, uh, the notes, the transcript of, of this conversation on our website. Uh, you, you should go to boundaryless.io slash resources slash podcast and you would find uh, Nafi's uh, conversation over there. And, uh, um, you know, uh, before we talk again, uh, remember to think boundaryless. So I, I think it was really interesting to talk to Nafiz, especially as we approach sort of the end of this season of the podcast, to, to really paint uh, the shifting background picture once again of what it really means to organize in this rapidly changing world. 
Yes, totally. What I bring home is that, uh, you know, with different types of energy models or infrastructures or transport or manufacturing, whatever. So how we, as we reorganize these capabilities, uh, we will have to rethink our organizational models, right? 